Hey, hey you. Now I'm not talking to them, I'm talking to you. Happy day after Christmas or happy 26th or happy Boxing Day. Boxing Day. Yes, and that doesn't mean what my brother and I thought it was meant, which was put on the gloves and go to it. it means take all those boxes and big day for the stores today. I don't know. I'm sitting in my pajamas still. Well, we've got good news. Everybody can sit in their pajamas today because we're back with our second day of the week ending the decade with what should we have learned from different years of the decade. This time we go to 2014. This time we're also going to have more of a consumer bent Yesterday, with the 2013 10G, Scott Tiras talked mostly about investing and saving money. Rod Griffin from Experian is going to probably focus a little more on credit, protecting yourself. It's a good A-B last year to this year. So, not only do we have that, we still have the retro theme music and the Seinfeld sound-alike uh, headline theme. This is episode 149 of the Stacky Benjamin Show from 2014. What did we learn in 2014? Come on, Charlie Brown. It's almost midnight. I'll pour you a root beer. Thank you, Lucy. I've decided next year I'm going to be a changed person. Oh, be serious, Charlie Brown. No, I mean it. I'm going to be strong and firm. Forget it, Charlie Brown. You'll always be wishy-washy. Why can't I change just a little bit? I've got it. I'll be wishy one day and washy the next. New Year's decorations are up, the mics are hot, and speaking of hot, man, do we have a hot show for you today. Rod Griffin from Experian joins us to talk about what we should have learned about our money and our credit in 2014. Live from my parents' basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and every year, this is my favorite podcast because we bring on a special guest to answer one big question. What should we have learned this year? Well, guess what? Today, we have our biggest New Year's guest ever from Experian, the director of public education for them. Big title, huh? Well, not always a big title. He's an awesome guest, a great guy. You're going to love his insights. Rod Griffin is here in the basement, but that's not all. Fidelity, maybe creating their own robo-advisor. The financial company Gang Tackle, the middle market continues. And what's more important than an advisor when it comes to deciding to save into your 401k? I mean, I thought for sure it'd be free ice cream. That gets me every time, but we'll give you the real answer on today's show. We got all that plus your letters and just when you least expect him to end out the year, PK is back. And you know what? He has probably his number one best takeaway of all of 2014 on today's show. First, the guy who needs no introduction, but we will anyway. The one and only OG. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, man. So we go at a party like it's 1999 down here. I can't believe that was 15 years ago. Isn't that scary? That's wild. Did you watch on TV like all day? I kept coming back to the television while they were doing the turn of the century from around the world. I don't remember that, but I do remember the quasi argument about... Oh, the technology was going to fail? No, no, no. About whether or not it was really the turn of the century or was right. the turn of the century in the 2001. Year. Yeah, that's 99 right. 99 to 2000, 2000, 2001. Yeah. I don't remember much. Oh, I do remember. I celebrated that New Year's in Colorado. Did you really? Yep. Watched the fireworks on Pikes Peak. Well, not on Pikes. I watched the fireworks from still kind of a... Outside of Pikes Peak. Near They Pikes were Peak. launching the fireworks on Pikes Peak and we were watching them from another place. Yes. Thank you. From La Quinta Inn. Can you La Quinta, which is lot. which is Spanish for next to the Denny's. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, you know what's You not, didn't make that up on your own. I did not. No. Nope. That is so bad. Hey, some news from Nick over at MagnifyMoney.com, our sponsor, OG. He tweeted earlier this month that there are some huge savings account interest rate wars going on. I love it when companies start war. having those. Yeah. Companies trying to lure customers. At the time that he wrote that, and this was over a couple of weeks ago, G was offering, wait for it. And it's funny that we're going to talk about how great an interest rate this is. 1.05. But that's pretty good. That's a very good rate right now. But man, the day when it was 5%, what happened to those days? So I don't know if that's the best right now, because as I said, that was a couple weeks ago before the holiday furlough that we had here. But you know how do you find out? You go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money and compare savings accounts. And very quickly, they'll make it easy to compare, ditch, switch, and save. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Check it out. By the way, Jay wrote me a note. And I've said before that you go stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And I'll apologize to people. They think that they're supposed to go to the website when I say that. You don't have to go to the website. You just put in stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Boom. You go to magnify money. Yeah. uh, Jay wrote me and said, hey, I really want to go to magnify money. Can you put a link on your homepage? And you know what? We'll go ahead and we'll do that. We'll put a square on the Stacking Benjamins homepage. You just go to stackingbenjamins.com. He also said one for Amazon. So we'll do that on the front page of stackingbenjamins.com. But anyway, how's that for a segue? But anyway. But anyway. Anywho, let's move. The segues just get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Ever since we won the award for a great segue, uh, Justin gave us the award. It's just been all downhill since then. Listen to this, OG. Fidelity Institutional Ways Robo Offering. Months after teaming up with Betterment. So just the lay of the land here. Betterment and Wealthfront and some others like Gemstep come out with these robo advisory firms, right? And then Personal Capital also comes out with one that has advisors that help you on the site, but a lot of help via electronics. Charles Schwab gets in the game offering their own robo-advisor, and Fidelity then teams up with Betterment, one of the early robo-advisors, and starts working with them. Well, now, months after teaming up with Betterment, they now add LearnVest to their platform. Fidelity Institutional, this article from investmentnews.com and Liz Skinner. Fidelity Institutional is rapidly expanding its robo-advisor offering and may even one day launch its own automated advice platform. The second largest custodian to registered investment advisors, Fidelity said two weeks ago that it will begin offering financial advisors access to LearnVest, an online advice platform. The move comes less than two months after they pair up with Betterment. One of the best quotes in this piece, OG, is Michael Durbin, president of Fidelity Institutional Wealth Services, says, we have a front row seat on what the market's looking for, and we're monitoring it very quickly to see what we could do on a proprietary basis. If I'm Betterman and I'm right now getting cozy with Fidelity, I wouldn't get too cozy. It looks like Fidelity's thinking about ditching Betterment and going on their own. Right. Well, they say you got to swim where the... Or, uh, swim. <laughs> You got to swim where the sharks are. You got to swim where the sharks are. You got to swim to where the puck's heading. That's how you lose a leg. (laughs) Yeah, so I think that this whole technology thing is nothing more than a ruse. and It's like the Charlie Chaplin. It's a fad. Thing that this whole movie business is nothing more than a fad. That's right. Yeah. Said in 1916. Electronic light bulbs. Not going to last forever, said the gas company. Man, the puck is headed that way, though. And Fidelity, so are they going to be the second mover? Now we're going to see all the big boys get in there. We're going to see Vanguard then offer robo-advisors and all the other big boys, T. Rowe Price. I think it'll be funny when the next big market correction happens. We'll see what happens. It will be. Well, you know, we'll Craig, Craig Matters from Money Magazine said that about one of the hot stock trading places. We asked him, what does he think? All these moves, is it a surge toward the future? And you know what he said? He said, they are all one correction away. Oh, yeah. That's what I think. One market correction away. Because think about it. The average person not getting advice, they know that it's robo-advisor, right? It's automatically being put in places. And so the second that your money starts going down, if there's not a human there to explain what's going on, OG, the first thing you think is the robot's screwing up. Yeah. And you and I know the robot's not screwing up. These guys have done their homework, but there's nobody to hold your hand and say, guess what? Time will tell. 
Yeah, it's crazy. Next is from Napa Net, National Association of Plant Advisors, a place where we get a ton of great fodder for the show, but it is a great site and they always have great articles. This one is more important than an advisor. Oh, gee, there was a recent study of 401k plan sponsors and it revealed that providing access to a financial advisor is important in encouraging employees to save, but not the most important one. I think this idea of giving people access to a financial advisor is a big idea. I mean, it's a great idea and I think more companies should do that. I even have retirement plans that we manage for small business owners and even trying to convince them to more or less sponsor us to get in front of their employees is really difficult. Why is that? I have no idea. Especially since we said on the show on Monday that these companies are seeing, OG, that workers, because they're not saving enough for retirement, they're a drag on productivity right? because they're only there for the paycheck. They're not there to work hard. And I'm not saying all old people don't want to work hard. <laughs> I'm just saying that there is now a percentage of the population. Yeah, some people who do that. Yeah. yeah. that Well, but just because they didn't have a pension, they never were taught to save into the 401k plan, so they haven't saved enough. Now they're in bad health too, so you're seeing cost of the healthcare plans go through the roof because of these people. Really? Really, I'm not going to say a lot of older workers, but there are older workers that are a drain on the system because they won't let a financial advisor in front of the employee to help them learn how yeah. to save. Well, I think it just goes to the point where they don't know who to turn to anyway. So it's just easier for the middle manager to punt the decision and not even think about it. Make no decision. So here's a question to you, OG, because you have not seen this article. I'm very curious to know what you think about this. So if in this survey... Access to a financial advisor is not the most important factor in encouraging employees to save. What encourages employees to save more than anything else? Does it involve a switch? A switch. Like a stick of some kind? (laughs) Start saving. Put your knuckles on the table. Yeah. Like the sisters at my old Catholic school that Uh I went to. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Believe it or not. Beatings uh, will continue until morale improves. (laughs) I have no idea. I'm happy. Pain, fear, so, anxiety. What is the number one reason? This survey was by American Century, and it was a matching contribution was the most important action a plan spots could take. More than half, 51% of people, OG, said it was extremely important that their plan sponsor match in the 401k. I think and part of the reason that I wanted to bring that up on today's show is that, number one, I believe it, but number two, you and I... Does a match make the top three reasons to save into a 401k? Well, it is free money. I would think that that's a really important thing for sure. But um, but if you've got a client, you're not going to say, there's no match, don't save there. No, no, probably not. I can't imagine. You know, I always encourage my clients to think that a match was icing on the cake. You mm-hmm. know, was just, hey, if we get a match, we got to take advantage of all that free money. But that's not the reason we save. I say because I want to retire someday. I mean, call me crazy. I want to retire someday. With money. Yeah. Well, preferably with your money, I want to retire. Dream on. What's the biggest lesson you learned in 2014, OG? Don't spit into the wind. Was that the biggest one? Stop eating yellow snow. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. (laughs) Is that it? Yeah, biggest lesson in 2014. Hmm. I don't know. I don't have any lessons. No. I learned. To, I think that I'm going to go with the stop eating yellow snow. Well, that's why you've delegated this to Rod Griffin. He's going to do all the things. He's going to do all the things. Good. So because I'm already on my like fifth margarita for <laughs> Happy New Year. That's what we're doing, right? We're drinking every time somebody changes time zones. He's already putting up. It's the, like an Epcot. Uh, we're drinking ourselves around the world, like every time zone. Drinking our way around the world. I've got a headache already, but. Coming down to the basement, party animal himself, Mr. Rod Griffin, with lessons we should have learned in 2013. And the Director of Public Education at Experian, Rod Griffin, joins us. Welcome to the basement, Rod. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. Well, it's always good to have a fellow Texan here in the basement, you know? Yeah, you're right on the border, though. You're almost not a Texan. (laughs) I am. I got to keep the Arkansanians. Is that what we call them? Arkansanians? Arkansanians? I got to keep them out. They're good folks, though. They are. You know, it's funny. I mean, do you know many people from Arkansas? 
my boss for 17 years was from Arkansas. She just retired. So I know lots of folks from Arkansas. So when we first moved here, I thought I'd heard the Arkansas redneck jokes. And I didn't realize that people from Arkansas, they all know the best redneck jokes, Rod. Like they are, it's (laughs) such self-deprecating humor. People from Arkansas are awesome. Well, Bill Clinton was from Arkansas. So we all know at least one famous (laughs) Arkansan who was extremely successful. So that's right. From that you know, little town called. What Hope. I found is being the butt of some redneck jokes that you learn to tell them too <laughs> when you're the butt of the joke. <laughs> oh, they are rednecks and proud of it. I have learned living in Texarkana, there is nothing wrong in being a redneck. You absolutely love that one. But something else we love is talking about what we should have learned this year because 12 months go by like 2014. In some ways, pretty rocky. I mean, we had new highs for the Dow and the S&P 500. Real estate prices climb. Oil prices and gold prices went through the floor. But it was also quite a year in the world of personal finance and credit. I think looking back over the last few years, 2014, Rod, I think had as many events that we can learn from as any other year. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. There's so much going on that hits us financially, and it all seems to trickle down to the credit report eventually in some ways. It affects your personal finance, which goes to all the credit issues we face. So yeah, there's a ton going on now and a ton that happened last year. Let's just jump right into them. Your number five is in 2014, we had a big change in the credit scoring models. What happened? Well, what happens is the credit scoring companies, companies like Vantage Score LLC and FICO and others, are always looking at the marketplace to see what is predictive of risk and what are people doing differently. And there was a couple of significant changes. For example, they're no longer including paid medical collections in credit scores. And Paid collections are being exempt also in some cases. So that's a pretty significant change when you think about the impact over the years that collection accounts have had. And so if you pay in a collection account at some point in the future, which is what we're learning right now, is that that won't affect you. If you pay a collection, you might see a significant jump in your credit scores, assuming everything else is good. Uh, same thing with medical debts. You know, if you've had a medical issue, when the new models are implemented, having that medical collection won't hurt your scores. Uh, anymore. So that's a pretty big change. That seems to me to be a step in the right direction. I think that it just seems to me colloquially that that would create a more realistic credit score. What's going to happen, and the thing to know is that it can take months or years for the new models to be implemented. So it could be quite a long time before we see that impact. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to see big jumps for millions of people in credit scores because At the same time, they're looking at other factors that indicate risk. So while a paid collection may not be counted anymore, something else is probably going to offset that. So the late payments that came before or Mm -hmm. things like that. So you'll probably aren't going to see a big jump. But for some people, that could be a really big deal. I think the one that we'll see most affected will be the medical issues and have collections because they sneak up on them. There's nothing you can do about it. And in terms of it's often paying those debts and I think that's going to help a lot of those folks. One thing I've never understood, Rod, is why things like utility bill payments can affect your credit score. It doesn't seem like that's a bill I haven't taken out any credit. Why does that affect my credit score? Well, it doesn't affect credit scores because it's not on the report. Ah, okay. So they're not reported to the Experian or the other credit bureaus yet. That's something we're looking at a lot, though. It's something we think of as alternative credit data, and it's very much like credit. You pay a fee for a service after you've received it. So utility bills, telephone bills, things like that. And we think they'd be very helpful, but there are some big hurdles. Yeah, I thought that had been added to the credit score. Of course, you know, John Alzheimer, we had him on earlier this year, and he was talking about the possibility of maybe your Facebook friends affecting your credit score. Do you see anything like that coming down the road? I hope not. <laughs> not for my sake. No. They want to know why I have like all of these like 15-year-old kids on my Facebook site because they're my granddaughter's friends. You know, it's one of those deals. Right. But I'm not strange. <laughs> that sounded horrible when I said it. But it's like, you know, I have grandkids. And so it's like, yes. it wouldn't make sense. I mean, the bottom line is you don't have any way to show that who your friends are on Facebook has any bearing on whether or not you'll pay your bills on time. Man. And that's the bottom line. When we have information excuse me, that's in a credit report and is used for scoring purposes, it has to have be shown scientifically, mathematically, statistically, that it does affect or predict the likelihood that a person will repay a debt. So your friends on Facebook, 
have not been shown as yet anyway to have any bearing on whether or not you'll pay your debts on time. So that's the key. I don't think we'll see that for a very long time. (laughs) Man, I hope not. (laughs) Number four on your list, and I saw it today. We're recording this about a week early, and I mentioned to you, Rod, that I was driving through Fort Smith, Arkansas this morning, and I saw $1.99 for gas. What's up with that? Uh, You got me beat. I saw one today for $2.05 a gallon in Dallas area. So from a credit standpoint, I think we're going to see some change. I think maybe people will travel. They're going to use that money to buy things that otherwise would have gone up and smoke literally in, for a lot of cars and maybe buy new cars too. I think when you look at gas prices, you look at maybe it's time to get a new car when the prices are down. So it gives them a little more pocket money and ability to save a bit, maybe buy a new car or a used one. Yeah. And when we're buying cars, what's going on with credit in the car market, Rod? That was really interesting in 2014. We at Experian, through our automotive division, saw some significant increase in car buying, both in used cars and new cars, and found a couple of interesting statistics around it. What we found was that more people are buying more expensive cars, so the the price of cars has gone up, and as a result, so have the loans. The loan amounts are higher than they've ever been before. And then to compensate for that fact, the length of the term has for car loans on average has gone up. We're seeing loans now that are as long as seven years for some cars, which is incredible compared to what you think of traditionally. Yeah, that's pretty scary. I mean, betting that your car is going to be around for seven years, and I know they make them more reliable than ever, that's still a scary proposition for your debt load. Yeah, especially when you consider the moment you pull off of a lot, you're typically upside down on a note. Right. Uh, you know, you hope it makes it seven years with no problems and you know, the cars are better than they've ever been. But that's a long time and a long time to own a car. The other thing we've seen is that lending criteria have loosened up a bit and we're seeing more subprime lending. That's scary. And yeah. So far, so good. I think they're looking very carefully at who they're lending to and how much. And so that subprime market early on in 2014 was doing really well. We weren't seeing any increase in delinquencies, anything like that. But as the year wore on, we did start to see an uptick. Not very much, but enough to raise your eyebrow a little bit, I think. We're still doing all right, but we're starting to see an increase in subprime delinquency and auto loans. So that may be something to watch in 2015 to see what happens there. Can we look for a second also at houses? Are you seeing credit flow more freely with houses? I just saw colloquially, Rod, that a woman qualified for a nearly $200,000 house with only $1,000 down. And between what you just told me with subprime lending ticking up and car loans being bigger and also now just this one story, we got another bubble coming? Are we all forgetting? We are a society with a very short memory. We think about credit cards instead of mortgages. We had I joke in my line of work several years ago when the mortgage market crashed. For the first time in history, Americans had a positive savings rate. And from the credit standpoint, I used to kind of say tongue-in-cheek, finally people are listening to what we always tell them in financial literacy that they should save and quit using so much credit. And look what it did. It killed our economy. So (laughs) that's what we get for people listening. But that's flipped now. People are more confident. We're starting to see the credit card balances increase too. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of loosening in the mortgage marketplace in terms of lending terms. I've seen a couple of anecdotal things about a few of the kinds of loans we used to hear about during the halcyon days of the mortgage market. But I don't think we're going back there. You know, there still aren't any of the no doc. Tell me how much you make and I'll get you that half a million dollar house. And we won't have to tell anybody about, (laughs) you know, what the paperwork actually says kind of things. It seems like banks would have learned their lesson. Even if the consumer has it, Rod, at least hopefully banks have. By the way, is this what your experience Christmas parties, your holiday parties are like as you guys stand around and tell credit jokes? <laughs> not so much. You know, we try to <laughs> put and not talk shop a lot of times, but sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes you look at the numbers and you watch what's going on and it's like, did you see some of the statistics lately? But yeah, it, it's really kind of fascinating for most of us. So I guess that's why we do what we do. Yeah, I think it's a pretty exciting business to be in. I would like going to work every day if I had your job. Talking about cheap gas and about some of the statistics that I've seen from Experian and other places around consumer confidence, that it seems like as we get more confidence and we have more money, we don't do anything constructive with it, Rod. We take out bigger car loans. We put more money on our credit card. What's wrong there? Why do we think that because we're more confident, we can run up our credit cards more? Because it's fun to spend (laughs) (laughs) until you get the bill. Um, And I think that's true. I mean, there's a part of us psychologically that likes to buy nice things. 
and especially around the end of you know, the holiday season. And like I said, we're taping this a little early and we're all thinking about the holidays and you want to spend. It makes you feel good. I think it's a psychological issue in a lot of cases. Yeah. It's hard to say no. But so far, what we're seeing over the 2014 is that even though we're seeing more spending and more debt a little bit, people are doing really well. Yeah. You know, we do an annual state of credit survey and scores actually crept up two points last year over 2013. And this sounds rather ominous, but to the average vantage score of the U.S. last year was 666, 666 hmm. but from 664. So it's up a bit. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing increases in other areas. So people are carrying more credit cards. On average, just over two cards in their wallet, up from 4.2%. Pardon me, from 2013, average debt's gone up to about $29,000. Does that include mortgage debt? So it does not include mortgage debt. Okay. So we're seeing some increase in the debt that people are carrying. But at the same time, we're not seeing significant increases in delinquencies, not seeing issues in that regard. They're up a little, but nothing alarming. They're where you would expect that kind of thing to be. So our, people are doing pretty well right now. Our number three on your list of things that we should have learned what had to do with immigration. And obviously we saw a big change with the White House change to immigration policy. You and I right here in Texas, not that well, we're on the other side of the state of the border, but we're more familiar with that than I was when I lived in Michigan. Of course, we had a border in Michigan, but nobody talks about the Canadian border, Rod. <laughs> How did immigration affect us financially? It's interesting. We watch immigration and talk about immigration, not from a border protection standpoint, but from a credit access standpoint. New immigrant populations often have difficulty accessing the traditional credit system. So when you're new to the country, you don't have a credit history. So the question becomes, how do you access that system? And quite often, they're low income or moderate income families, and they're struggling to break out of a cycle of the kinds of high cost, high fee, predatory lending, and it's difficult to do. So we're looking at ways for new immigrant populations to access traditional lower cost credit that will help them build their financial capability over time. So we're always looking at things like you mentioned earlier, utilities being reported, they're mm -hmm. not yet. We now report rent payments at Experian. So if a person has rent that they would like to have reported, positive rent payments can help build a credit history. And we're looking at all sorts of alternative things because what we find is you know, those populations are not unlike a lot of the low-income, moderate-income families who aren't immigrants. So it affects everybody. If we can help the immigrant population, new immigrants and emerging consumers establish credit and improve their financial capability, it contributes to our overall economy and helps everyone else as well. So it's a very important development. So with the talk about immigration, I think it's an important issue for us to look at from an economic standpoint overall. Some of the secured credit cards got hot a few years ago to help people build credit. Will we find a way that some of the immigrant population will be able to latch on to those or are we not going that way anymore as a society? It's still an option, but it's difficult. Some of the other things we see with immigrant populations are that attitudes and perceptions of the traditional banking system oh. in the U.S. are different than what average Americans would think of. You know, people have grown up in that system, so there are trust issues, things that need to be overcome and proven for new immigrant populations so that they're comfortable with our system as well. So things that are completely new to them, understandably, are kind of can be kind of frightening and unnerving. And so it's important that we find new alternative kinds of credit data that is predictive that help them enter the marketplace effectively and comfortably. I remember my old job interfacing with the Federal Reserve much more often than I do now, that the big problem they faced was with the percentage of the population that was unbanked, as they called it, people that didn't have a bank account. That's kind of the stuff you're talking about. That's it, exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's exactly what I'm talking about. And we, you know, we work at Experian, work with an organization called Credit Builders Alliance that works with nonprofit organizations who in turn work with immigrant populations and underserved populations, the unbanked and underbanked, and help them report information that otherwise couldn't be. I mean, that's very credit-like is the term we use. So yeah, I think it's a really important mm -hmm. issue and not a small issue for our economy as a whole. Yeah, boy. And I mean, just even on a more personal level, a lot of these people, as you know, Rod, just stuff cash in their house, which is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. 
Yeah. For some cultures, when they come to the U.S., their banking plan is to save under the mattress. Ugh. So it's even then, you think about it even in a broader terms, it's not just about being able to become more financially successful to save. It's a matter of safety in some cases. Well, I think in the world of personal finance, those three were big, but these last two might be on their own <laughs> tier well above them. Because every once in a while, I'm thinking, Rod, maybe every three hours, I heard that student loan debt is a big problem in this country, maybe worldwide. But I don't know if there's been enough proof yet of that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking. This has been a huge problem in 2014. Yeah, well, we all know education's cheap. Right. So, <laughs> through so, high school, and it gets really expensive. I was going to say, I'm yeah. laughing because I've got two kids in college at the same time right now, which yeah. is why I'm bald. So, it's, Oh, yeah, I was going to say, your hair's getting thin like mine or gray like mine or both. <laughs> yeah, student loan debt has obviously been in the news throughout 2014. And as most people know, student loan debt actually exceeded credit card debt, uh, unnerving in and of itself. And we have young people coming out of college who are so deep in debt that they can't get established as adults or they're unable to engage in the economy in the marketplace. So while they're trying to pay off debt, they can't often invest in retirement or in other things in buying a home, things that will help them be more successful financially over their lifetime. So it's a huge, huge problem. And we work with a number of organizations, part of my role is financial literacy grants. And we're working with an organization called the American Student Assistance. And one of the things they're doing is actually traveling. They're put together a mobile counseling system to try to talk to students, particularly in the Northeast as kind of the pilot, in communities where they have first-time students and families to talk to them about what student loan debt is and how to make those decisions and how to make sure you're going to be able to repay the debt so it's a huge long-term problem. I saw with the budget agreement that reached just before the end of the year here that some of the Pell Grant access was rolled back a little bit. Do we see, yeah. is there still either a big default coming or some big legislative changes coming? Do you see one of those two that are still going to have to happen? It seemed like about halfway through the year I kept reading that one of those two is going to be inevitable, Rod. Yeah, I don't know. When you look at student loan debt, well over 90% is federally insured. So my feeling is that I've seen it compared to the mortgage crisis, but I don't think we'll see that because of the vast amount of student loan debt is structured, guaranteed student lending programs. But I don't know. I can't speak to what our government will do. Uh, <laughs> you just never know. But, <laughs> so, you know, I can't speak to that. I think what I see is the people who are most affected are those who are, have private loans mm -hmm. and unfortunately may be working with institutions that aren't as ethical mm -hmm. as some other, as many. So the average student loan debt, the, the other thing that I keep asking about and looking at is, the average student loan debt is something around $30,000 or under $30,000. So that number isn't as scary to me. But when you look at people who are taking on huge amounts of debts or even debt to that amount, but they're going to schools and they really aren't equipped to complete their education – and aren't ending up leaving school with a large amount of debt and no degree or training to show for it, those are the people I think we need to be most concerned about helping because they're really the hardest hit. It seems like the takeaway is we need to weigh the, I guess what we should have learned from 2014 is we need to weigh the cost benefit analysis of a college education better yeah. than we have in the past. I think it's exactly true. Yeah. And, you know, we need to make sure that people who are taking loans are prepared to go to college. You know, I've seen a little bit about that, that some people are taking advantage of and then looking at what really is the value. Is it going to bring the value you need? Personally, I've talked to high school teachers and administrators and one of the conversations I often have is, are we really doing what we should in high school? Something around 70% of students will never go to college. So the percentage of college-bound students out of high school is actually very small, yet everything we do in schools, testing, coursework, <laughs> is focusing on students going to college. Right. You know, so what about these kids that ought to be going to and want to go to and would be very successful going to a trade school? or getting some other kind of certification, how do we make sure we take care of that 70 to 80% of the student population and make sure they're getting education and training that's going to help them be successful and, and a productive member of our society? I'm sure we'll solve that one in 2015, right? 
Yeah, there you, you just work on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little. Right. All right. It's time for our number one. I got goosebumps, Rod. I wish I had a drum roll. But your big number one thing we should have learned in 2015 had to do with, and this is funny, it seems like forever ago, Rod, that the big problem was was that Target had a data breach. I don't know if people even remember Target had a data breach because there have been so damn many since then. What's a data breach? No, no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Ask anybody at Sony. Just, yeah, just watch Twitter. The next one will pop up. It's like a Twitter fall. You know, it really is. Happening. If I get another letter telling me I get free credit monitoring because somebody else has my data. You, that's something we are very concerned about. There are regulations around data breach notification that businesses have to send. And there's something called uh, data breach fatigue. And it's a little bit concerning that people may start to ignore those breaches oh. uh, and the notices, which could be very harmful for them. You need to be proactive or reactive <laughs> when you get the notice, be, you're reacting. But to the breach notifications, make sure that you're okay. It's going to be a continuing problem. I think we're watching now with the Sony breach, which is fortunately in some ways not related to credit, but it's still a data breach. The issue of security for databases is huge. But as an individual, it's equally important to make sure that you are staying on top of your information. Tell people, check your credit report at least once a year. And fewer than half of people who are eligible actually do. So it's hard to get them to check that information. Make sure it's correct. It's free. Annualcreditreport.com. Go get your report. No one's there. If you find evidence of fraud, we can help get that corrected. If you're concerned about it, you can sign up and just to plug one of our products, protectmyid.com. You can monitor your credit history and make sure everything's like it should be. But take advantage of those services when they're offered at no cost because they can help protect you and help you recover. But you're right. Data breaches are frightening. I see, Rod, not to cut you off, but I see in some places they say that credit monitoring services are a waste of money because of the fact that the companies will come to your rescue or whatever. But on the other side, I hear you say that we should check it once a year. We can get it for free, but nobody ever does it. It seems like a credit monitoring service that costs you very little per year. I don't know. To me, it makes a ton of sense, even though I keep hearing it's a waste of money. Where do you come down on that? I agree with you. I think I could say that about my lawn service too. I could mow my own lawn. Actually, I do mow my own lawn, but I could spread the fertilizer, but it's a matter of investing in things that somebody else can take care of that for me. It's worth that investment to me. And I think credit monitoring is the same thing. If you have to respond to every one of those breach notices that you get, you could spend all of your time doing that. But a monitoring service gives you an early alert right away. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. And if something happens, you've got people there who can help you with the problem. So that's the value. It's a service. I always say it's not right for everyone, but for a lot of people it is because it gives them peace of mind and lets them know that they're going to find out if something happens and they're going to find out right away. And I think that's really valuable. It seems like pretty cheap insurance to me. In the big scheme of things, all the things that we pay for, right? It it just seems like pretty cheap insurance. It also seems like with all the data breaches, I think it probably is time to change your password from password one, two to something else. Like your mother's maiden name. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because nobody will guess that. (laughs) Yeah. And that's true. Or password, which is actually the most common password. Is it still? It still is. Oh. <laughs> it still is. It's a challenge for struggling minds like mine. Trying to remember all of my passwords gets to be a royal pain. Do you like the keychain things that you can download? I don't know. I'm still sort of undecided about that. It helps, but then again, and I'm sort of the slow adopter to the cloud as well because there's data out there. Somebody has it. Could it be accessed? You know, I want to be sure it's secure. But I'm getting to a point where I think that's going to have to happen because I keep a list, shouldn't say that, but it's in a safe place, it's in a safe actually, of passwords that I have to keep updated so that when I go to a site that I visit once a year, I can go find my password. It isn't an Excel file on your desktop? No, it is not. <laughs> this says passwords. <laughs> yeah. Click Under here. Under the password, password. Yeah, right. No, it is not. <laughs> That's great. I wondered that too, because although I've seen heavier, it seems to me, once again, colloquially, Rod, that there's been much heavier adoption of these password keychain systems. I still feel like if I'm buying into their algorithm and they get hacked, okay, now yeah. they don't have one of my passwords, they have all of them. I'm all of them. And that's what I'm kind of struggling with. Yeah. Um, it becomes another issue of data security and then the threat of a data breach. 
I'm undecided at this point. Looking at them more seriously all the time, though, because passwords also have to be more complex all the time. We've gone to from like four characters to eight or ten, in some cases as many as 12 characters, and they alphanumeric and special characters. And it's getting so complex that I don't think any individual will be able to manage all of them and remember them and use them without some sort of system to help. Yeah. Well, that is quite a list, and 2014 was one heck of a year. What do you and Experian Rod have cooking for us for 2015? (laughs) Anything you can disclose? Anything you'd like to announce here on Stacking Benjamins that's going to change the world from Experian this coming year? Not that I can announce. I I hope we can change the world. I think we're going to see more of the same in some cases. I think we're seeing improvement in the job market creeping along but getting better. We're seeing improvement in small business. So you know, I think all of those things are positive. I don't know that there'll be one world-changing issue, but I think we're going to continue to see slow, gradual improvement economically. And I hope we don't have another major, major incident like we saw last year, two or three different occasions with the data breaches. We figure out how to handle that better. Um, but we want to stay engaged and keep helping people manage their credit well and become more financially successful. What's a service that Experian offers that's something that our listeners might like to hear about that they might not know that you guys even do? Oh, wow. At Experian, we are, to brag a little, the world's largest information services company. So people think of us as a credit reporting company when, in fact, we're a lot more than that. That's just one of our businesses. If you're planning to buy a used car, you can check out AutoCheck. It's a automotive history report. Actually, the NADA preferred and dealer preferred report, or at least was for a long time, but dealers use our report. So go to autocheck.com. You can check that out. If you are interested in monitoring your credit, trying to figure out what you need to do to make your scores better, if you can subscribe to Credit Tracker. We have a great service called Credit Educator that helps people if you've had issues or you're trying to understand credit scoring for $39.95. You can get a credit report, credit score, and at least 30 minutes with a trained representative who can walk through your report line by line and tell you exactly what you need to work on, can even tell you things like if you have $1,000, where would that best be put toward your debts to improve your scores the most? Wow. Uh, you know, so lots of things like that going on. We are a small business credit reporting company. Check out our business credit reports. If you go to Experian.com, you can find all of this stuff. Check out some of those businesses as well. So we're there for small business owners, for individual consumers, for big business. Yeah, I'll include links to all those, everybody in the show notes too, at stackingbenjamins.com. And one other thing comes to mind is join us for our credit chat every yes. Wednesday at noon Pacific. Yes. So yeah. We're on at noon Pacific, 2 o'clock Central, hashtag credit chat. And it's just an open conversation on credit reports, scores, and lots of other topics. I think you've joined us a time or two. I was going to say, I'm sure that was your best episode ever. That was Absolutely. No doubt. (laughs) We did have fun then. And that's how I discovered Brian Worley, who was just on a couple weeks ago about planning parties. Yeah. That was fun. That was from you crazy people that I actually first met Brian. (laughs) So what is one overall lesson you hope that we're all going to remember from 2014 that we can really use to have a better 2015, Rod? From my perspective, there's one thing everybody can do, and that's get your credit report. Know what's in it. Go to annualcreditreport.com, get that free report, and work with us. Engage with Experian. We want to engage with you. We want to help people make sure that that information is accurate, that it's protected, that it helps you as a consumer get the services you want and need when you need them. So simple but incredibly important. Hey, trivia fans, man, am I looking forward to 2015. I mean, I've already made out my list of resolutions and everything. I know, I'm prepared like Dave Ramsey at a credit card convention. So here's my list. Number one, in 2015, I'll be less awesome, since that's really the only thing I do to excess. Number two, I resolve to be luckier with my investment dart throws. And the big one, number three, in 2015, I'll find new and interesting things to hate about these dorks in the basement. The problems I've got now, you know, they're really getting kind of old. Speaking of that, this segment's getting old, and I haven't even given you a trivia question. So here's one. What is the most listed New Year's resolution? I'll have the answer shortly. And now for something completely different. Pure, unadulterated genius from PK at DQYDJ.net. 
Hello, Stacking Benjamins listeners. This is PK, an average at best internet writer from a decidedly above average website, dqydj.net, which stands for Don't Quit Your Day Job. I bet you have a problem with that characterization of myself, and I bet you'll like this particular segment. Want to know why? We're going to be talking about bets, at least in our strange way. Last segment, I bored you to death about inflation, but I brought up a very important point about revealed preferences. You see, the inflation predictions and the volatility predictions that we mentioned in our last segment were revealed by consumer decisions. Well, uh, at least investor decisions. But really, if you think about it, that's just a particular form of consumer. Because traders were putting up real money in their bets on nominal or inflation-protected securities, and because investors were buying and selling puts and calls on the S&P 500, The numbers we pull for inflation expectations and volatility have a solid base in reality. And why is that? Well, simple. Revealed preferences, where you have to put your money up as a form of bet, are, in general, more reliable. In Nate Silver of 538 fame's 2012 book, The Signal and Noise, there's a very detailed look into the phenomenon of betting markets. And many of you probably remember a site called Intrade, which wonks like yours truly would track daily during election season. Why didn't we go straight to polling averages or models uh, during that time? Well, for one, bias. While an illiquid contract might be biased by a few whales making huge bets, Good luck manipulating a market as big as, say, treasuries or S&P 500 options. Consider that when a normal poll is run, you have all sorts of irregularities which make polling an art and a science. Do you call landlines and cell phones? Who is more likely to pick up? What do the words vary or slightly mean to different people? And yes, on and on and on. Let me illustrate this another way. Have you ever gotten together with friends and played a card game such as poker without real money? it would quickly devolve into people going all in on joke hands. Your takeaway, and the point of this piece, if you want to know the preferences of a group of people, or yes, even a single person, don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do and where they put their resources. Now back to that almighty resource of the basement and the rest of the crew. I bet you're happy. Hey, Trivia Heads, this year's coming to a close, and I've decided to have a glass-half-full kind of attitude. The way these basement New Year's parties go, it'll have to be half-full of stuff like rum or bourbon or whiskey, but hey, I'll, I'll persevere. I'll make it through. Let's get you that trivia question one more time. What's the number one most listed New Year's resolution? The answer? A budget? Nope. That's the number three resolution on the list, which is topped by losing weight. Which is perfect, because we could stand to lose some dead weight around here on this show. Speaking of, here's Joe and OG. Got to say a big thank you from Nick and the gang to all of you out there who use the stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money link in 2014. You know what we've known since they've been our sponsor, which is if you go there within a couple minutes, you will find out that maybe your savings account, your checking account, or your credit card is not the optimal one for you. Takes just a couple minutes. They rank them very, very simply. You know how all of these banking solutions are all about gobbledygook. Very, very crisp and easy to follow to find out how to compare your accounts that you have now switch, ditch the old account, save a bunch of money. Average person saves up to $450. People have saved thousands using that link. So what are you waiting for? Start off 2015 on the right note. Go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And when midnight hits here tonight, OG, you'll be partying like OG. We've 
got letters. And by the way, uh, next Wednesday is our big letters episode. Set them in because our guest on next Wednesday's show is you. And also, Nick over at Magnify Money is going to be answering debt-related questions and banking. If you got questions about checking accounts, savings accounts, about using credit card swapping strategies to lower your debt, Nick is going to take all those questions next Friday on the show. How great is that? So those are upcoming shows. But for now... We got a letter from Graydon, and Graydon is talking about OG, you and your door handles, and what he learned from that. For those people that did know, I showed you how fancy those door handles were. Just a second, those are those are, door those are very. They, fancy. they open and close the door. They do, and so OG was able to purchase a high-end luxury car for less money than most people spend on their beater car, mm-hmm. and it is a fine automobile. However. He had to pay a lot of money for some new door handles. So anyway, Graydon said, hearing OG's moral of it's always better to repair your car than to buy a new one is something that struck close to home. After college, I made the mistake it seems everyone makes, and that's buy a car I wanted, not a car I could afford. How many people did that? James Kinson, who was on the show, said he was making $8,500 OG living in his parents' basement, and he bought a car for 8300 bucks. Nice. <laughs> I mean, he spent his whole year's salary living at That's his- the ratio. It's like an engagement ring. <laughs> it's one year's salary. We can play one year's salary on cars? <laughs> This is going to be news to the old lady. Guess what? Guess what, sweetheart? Guess yeah. what we're getting? Well, he says, Graydon says, four years later, his 2002 Xterra is in need of a new transmission. The car is worth maybe 3000 and the new tranny is going to set him back 4000 As an aside, that's quite a coincidence that the transmission is the same as OG's door handles. <laughs> if I learned anything from today's podcast, it's to stay out of the luxury import market. I'd already been planning on replacing my Xterra because the manual transmission was fine in California, but my new home in Seattle has far too many hills for comfort. Imagine, by the way, having a stick and you live in Seattle with all those hills, OG. What a nightmare. I've got a car right on my butt, and I've got to figure (laughs) out... Yeah. Speaking of grinding the clutch. Yeah. 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 Also, I know gas mileage isn't a good reason to replace a car, but my commute recently went from four miles to 40, and I'd love to spend less time at the gas station. My plan now is to try and squeak another year out of the Xterra as it is, and then get something sensible like a Corolla Civic or a Mazda 3 used indubitably. Big word there, Graydon. Nice. Maybe I should just bite the bullet and eat the repair bill. I do love the SUV. It reminds me of being young and stupid. (laughs) (laughs) And sometimes we need that reminder. Don't we? I got a story about that. My girlfriend and I will discuss it when she gets back home. So he's writing to us while he waits for the real pro's girlfriend. Yeah, to for the real answer, or maybe when she gets back home in three years from her trip around the world. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) He doesn't say. She'll undoubtedly tell me to keep it, but I think it's time to move on. So. What, what say you, you man? Yeah. The car's worth three thousand. Replacing the transmission's four thousand. Gone. I'm walking into the dealership tomorrow. What do I get out of it? I'm not going to spend more money on the car because here's the thing: it's not like putting a four thousand dollar transmission now makes the car worth seven thousand. Putting a four thousand dollar transmission in it makes it worth thirty seven hundred. So you're going to take James Kinson's advice from a couple of weeks ago when he was on talking about cash cars and sell the car to the dealer, but then buy a used car. Yeah, I would sell it to the first person that would give me a reasonable price for it. Right. Six bucks. No, reasonable. I mean, if it's worth 3000 yes, right. and you've got the data to back it up, I have always had success selling cars privately. You get a little bit higher markup on that. Right. With something like a busted up transmission, though, mm-hmm. I don't know that I would monkey with selling my neighbor my busted up transmission car because... Those things could come back to haunt you, I think, in karma ways. So I would be upfront and truthful about it, but I would... Would you call that car karma? Car karma. Car karma. Car karma. It's car karma, actually, but yeah. Car karma. karma. I'm Um, pronouncing it wrong. Yes. The inflections on the... Wrong syllable. Yes. Yes. I've said that so many times, I don't think I could actually say the word syllable correctly, like the first time without thinking it up, because I've said syllable so many times. In any event, so I would sell the car tonight and be done with it, and take the $4,000 that you were going to use to pay the car repair bill, and use that to buy something that will last you kind of that intermediate term. I've found that the sweet spot somewhere in that like twenty to $30,000 range of cars, because you can find a really nice $40,000 car that's used 
for twenty five thousand or twenty thousand or a thirty five thousand dollar car slightly used for fifteen or eighteen thousand dollars. So that's kind of where I've fallen in my life and experience. But maybe you're not ready to pull the trigger on a twenty five thousand dollar purchase. I was to say if he's twenty six years old, twenty seven years yeah. old, he might not be ready to Yeah, to write a check or have all that cash later on, which is yeah. fine. So find something that's in between, something that'll just get you there. Yeah. So I'm not saying four thousand would, but maybe four thousand, yeah. God forbid I say this, but maybe four thousand and a ten thousand dollar loan from your parents or from the bank or something like that will make up the difference while you're able to what you know, I do build the I cash would, to I go back to that James Kinson episode, Graydon, and listen to him talking about cash cars because James had a ton of advice there. But I'm with you, OG. I think you get rid of the Xterra now. I do like this idea of seeing the Xterra and it reminds me of being young and yeah. stupid. I had the story I was going to tell you on that. No, I had just started my career and I was renting a house. You know, Dave Ramsey talks about buying a beater car. Right. I owned a beater house. Nice. Well, you rented a beater house. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were renting a beater house. And I had young kids and a young spouse just out of college, mm-hmm. as I've written before, debt. And I'd gone through my year with no money. And so my kids were starting to grow a little bit older. And I thought, hey, let's rent a bigger house. And I got this idea to rent a bigger house. And I actually got a free consultation one day with this coach. I won this consultation. This coach had no idea that I didn't have any money. And they thought that, you know, it was one of those deals, like get a free consultation and then they'll hook me into coaching. Well, that was never going to happen. But during that session, I said, hey, I'm running this house for $800 a month. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of renting this house for $1,300 a month. And the woman goes, well, what's better about it? I'm like, the house is doubly as big and I'm paying not double as much. Right. So I'll be renting this place that's much bigger, much nicer. And she goes, well, why do you want a nicer place? I said, well, my family is doing well and I think I deserve it and all this stuff. And she goes, do you really still have a lot of debt? You told me earlier you didn't make money for a year and you have a ton of debt and went through all that. So, yes, I do. I have a mm-hmm. ton of debt. Okay. Do you want to be renting a house forever? I said, well, no, I think sometime when I make more money, I'd like to buy a house. She's like, why do you want to make your life look really good when it sucks? Why not come home to this house that is not the house that you want every day to remind yourself that, right. that you deserve better? Not to rent better, but to own better. Yeah. And man, did that stick with me. So I said, nope, not going to rent the bigger place. I'm going to stick it out here. And mm-hmm. Well, I would suspect, Graydon, I would suspect that if you've got tolerably decent credit, you can probably borrow 10000 bucks against a $15,000 car, put five grand down or whatever, and make a really aggressive plan to pay that off very quickly. Assuming that's somewhat of a professional job. So you I wouldn't imagine. do the cash car? Well, eventually, yeah. I wouldn't buy a $4,000 car. That's not any better than a $3,000 car. Yeah. But let's say that you bought a $15,000 car, or in this case, 14000 just to make the math easy, right? The depreciation on that car is not going to go from fourteen to three over the next year and a half. It could go from fourteen to... 12 or from yeah. 14 to 10 maybe. But what if Graydon has a ton of debt? Well, he doesn't say that. So yeah, he I'm not going to what if the heck of this. But yeah, because if somebody, I mean, somebody has a ton of debt, I would do the Dave Ramsey thing and I would buy a $3,000 yes. car. Yes. If you've got other obligations that are profound, then yeah, I would buy the $4,000 car. But actually, you could buy the seven thousand dollar car. Really, I mean, you've got a three thousand dollar value of your current one, and you got four thousand bucks to pay on the new transmission. Yeah, you're, you're buying a seven thousand dollar. Your car. whole goal is reliability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, plus return on investment. If you take four thousand bucks and put it into this car, it's not worth seven grand all of a sudden. Yeah, right. Contrast that now. Honestly, contrast that to mine, and that is the case. My car is worth more by having functioning door handles. It sounds silly, but it really is. I mean, some of the features that... To people in that market. Yeah, absolutely. If I went to sell my car, you know, somebody said, well, the door doesn't lock and it doesn't shut correctly. But that's when you say, haven't you ever seen the Dukes of Hazard? Yeah, I jumped through the window. Come on. Thanks, Graydon, for the question. And if you've got a question, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, send those because next Wednesday, all questions all the time. But even if you get them after that, we get them after that, we will read them on the air and answer you. And another way that you can help us is by leaving a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to the podcast. That helps us find new listeners. And another review, OG, that mom said we can put on the refrigerator. This is a great one. It comes from Penguin Slice. It's a five-star review and says, my new favorite podcast. 
Exclamation point. I just recently stumbled across your podcast and have been addicted ever since. We like getting people addicted to good stuff like good money management. Mm -hmm. I mostly listen to financial shows and find yours to be educational and very funny, a combination most other podcasts have yet to master. It makes my hour-long commute from New Hampshire to Boston much more tolerable. Boston. Boston. Boston, uh, Massachusetts. Joe at uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Joe and OG really know their stuff, but come across as two regular guys you'd like to invite over for a cookout. E, not uh, him, though. Penguin, he eats like you would not believe. Who, me? Yeah, you. Are you talking about me? I'm talking about you. Oh, well, I, I was going to say Penguin Slice. Joe at StackedBenjamins.com. Cookout. We're there. Do you think that they eat penguin? Is that why they... Just a little slice of penguin? Slices of penguin. I, I don't know. Keep up the good work. P.S. Love. See, I can't say that. I can't believe Penguin Slice would put that in the review. Penguin Slice stops the review right there. What am I talking about? There is nothing else to see in that review. Penguin Slice is going to get voted off the island if they do that again. All right. That's it. Thanks for the review. And please, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever. Still, no more reviews on Stitcher. What's going on there? That's it, OG. Another show. How great was that? Fantastic. Fantabulous. Hey, I went to see a movie. At this part of the show, if you're new to Stacking Benjamins, OG and I see a lot of movies every year. I was counting, and I always count. I always count, as you know, any movie that's up for like an Oscar award, I count it as a movie I saw the year before. So I still have to count all those movies. I have seen 55 movies so far this year. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's super. Yeah. And boy, are my arms tired. Nope. <laughs> no idea what that means. But this movie I saw just before the holidays, and it is called Dumb and Dumber 2. There he is again. Almost two decades, and he still comes. How you doing, buddy? Brought you your favorite candies. Come on, Lloyd, you gotta get over her. Mary Samsonite was just a girl. That's it, kid. Come on, come on, come on. Spit it out. God, yeah! <laughs> Wait a minute. So you mean you have been faking for 20 years mm -hmm. and it was all for a gag? Yep. That's. Awesome! <laughs> oh, oh. Why don't you roll me inside? We'll get the nurse to take the catheter out of me. We don't need nurses for that. But don't you have to... Have and that's pretty much the way the humor goes the entire movie, <laughs> OG. Is it as good as Dumb and Dumber 1? Answer number one is no. Oh, bummer. Definitely yeah, not really. as good. But you know what? This will definitely not be the classic that the first Dumb and Dumber was. But it's the same exact type of humor. If you're the type of person that liked Dumb and Dumber 1... Here's what's amazing to be in these movies. Jim Carrey, you expect him to be funny. I actually think he's kind of the problem in this movie, and this is me just prognosticating. I think that when Jim Carrey made Dumb and Dumber 1, he was on top of his game. How long ago was that? 20 years ago? Yeah, 20 years. I think it was 1994. What was it? Yeah. I mean, when he made that movie, he was on the top of his game. They were doing In Living Color, if you remember that, which was huge with the in Wayans brothers color. and just a hilarious show. He was on it. And then he became a rich guy and really done some kind of weird things lately. And when Jim Carrey's shtick is kind of a shadow of what it was. It doesn't seem as funny. It seems like he's Jim Carrey old guy trying to be Jim Carrey young guy. Mm. Where Jeff Dan Too tired. Yeah. It's a tired approach. Yeah. Okay. Jeff Daniels, though, once again proves just... I've always thought Jeff Daniels is just a very good actor. I like him in the newsroom. I've liked him in nearly every movie I've seen this guy in. Jeff Daniels proves again by staying right there with Jim Carrey, man. I think Jeff Daniels keeps this movie afloat. Man, I thought it was funny. Kathleen Turner plays this woman that apparently Jeff Daniels had had intimate relations with, mm. and they had a daughter. And Jeff Daniels goes to search for his daughter because he needs a kidney, and he needs to get it from a relative. And it turns out he goes to get it from his parents, and his parents open up the door, OG, and this is at the beginning of the movie. His parents open up the door when they go to ask them to maybe donate a kidney for him, mm -hmm. and they're Asian. 
And Jeff Daniels asked them for a kidney. And Jeff Daniels' dad says, in a very Asian accent, says, I don't know if you know this. I don't remember what his name is in the movie. Lloyd. Yeah, Lloyd. Lloyd I don't, Christmas. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, Lloyd, but you were adopted. And Lloyd goes off the deep end because he can't believe that he's adopted. <laughs> but, 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 and it's it's that kind of stuff. It's, some of the jokes are reprises of the old jokes, like the one that we talked about on the last show. What's the soup du jour? That's the soup of the day. Mm, sounds good. I'll have it. They walk up to a bar and they say, so how much would it cost us to buy a beer? Oh, the beers are gratis. Oh, that sounds expensive. Mm. So then they come up with this huge plan to get free beer because the beer is gratis and they can't afford it. They can't afford it. <laughs> nice. So just the same type of humor. Cheryl did not want to see this movie, shockingly. Shocking. Yeah. So I went to see it by myself and I got, I'm going to say, seven good laugh out louds. The other funny movie I went to this year, that the only reason I went to it was because I thought it would be funny, was Tammy. Remember Tammy? I remember the... Uh Previews of it, yeah. Yeah. Tammy was... This movie beat the heck out of Tammy. Okay. I mean, Tammy was so bad. Tammy had one funny scene. But anyway, did the movie with her, Melissa McCarthy, and did that come out this year in Sandra Bullock? Was that this year? No, that was last year. That Heat. was last year. The yeah. Heat. That movie was awesome. Yes. Yes, it was. Heat was out last year. Bridemaids. The Heat. Yeah, The Heat was out last year. Man, I thought that was funny. Oh, Bridesmaids wasn't out last year. The one with Jennifer Aniston where they have to drive into Mexico and they have the fake family. We are the Millers. We are the Millers. Again, hilarious movie. Mm -hmm. Horrible Bosses 1, hilarious movie. This one, not as good as those, but way better than Tammy. Okay. So a fun rental on an airplane where you're distracted. Good to know. Not bad. At the end of the movie, I'll tell you this joke too because it's not, I mean, it's another groaner. The movie's over. You know, they have the credits. Right. The other four people in the theater left. And I sat because I thought if any movie's going to have something stupid, another bad joke after the credits, it'll be this movie. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, I'm right. So they're driving to Zamboni down the road, which is another joke in the movie that I won't get right. into. So driving to Zamboni down the road and Jeff Daniels goes, Fat, this restaurant screwed up my milkshake. I ordered chocolate and they gave me vanilla. And Jim Carrey goes, they screwed up mine too. I ordered vanilla and they gave me chocolate. And that's the last joke of the movie. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I saw a movie. No way. I did. It just came to me as we were talking. And? Oh, do you want me to talk about it? We're at 34 minutes. So that's a no? <laughs> Maybe next time. Yeah. Well, tell us what it was. I saw Madagascar, the Madagascar Penguins. The Penguins oh! Movie. We got to talk about that next week. We'll do. We have to. If you're out tonight, be safe, everybody. Big, scary night for drunk drivers. New Year's Eve, so be careful tonight. And, uh... Happy New Year, OG. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody. Thanks for spending 2014 with Stacking Benjamins, and we'll see you in 2015. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC, copyright 2013. This show is produced by Joe Saul Cihai and is edited by Joe and Isabella Bianca. Make some noise! Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one! PK can be found at his other gig on DQYDJ.net or curled up on the floor in a fetal position next to the freezer. The part of Joe's mom's neighbor Doug is played by, well, if you haven't figured that one out by now, you're just not paying attention. Welcome to the after show, the part of the show that Penguin Slice doesn't realize you don't talk about. What happens in the after show stays in the after show. You don't talk about Fight Club, OG. It's better not to. So we're going to talk about New Year's resolutions next week. but uh, The new, ones that I've already failed at? My, my New Year's resolution is to break my New Year's resolutions. Perfect. Then I'll succeed. Wow. How shatteringly 
Meta. Mm, wow. That just meta. Blew my mind. Yes. What movie that's coming up? My New Year's resolution mm-hmm. okay. is 1080p. I don't get it. Like you want a 1080p TV? The resolution on my new, never mind. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was stupid. So out of all the movies that are coming up that you know of, what's a must see for the early part of 2015? Or any of 2015. I don't know, because whenever a studio tells me the movie's coming out in January, I'm like, that's because it wasn't good enough to come out in the holiday season. Oh, really? Yeah. And so whenever I see a movie that's coming out in January, I go, okay, somebody knows something I don't know, because I've yet to see a movie that wasn't a movie that held. Now, in January, the whole month of January, you're getting holdovers from the good Christmas crop. Right. The ones that are all up for the awards and stuff. So you see those. But movies that just came out. What about throughout the whole year? Anything that you know of that's coming out? I saw the trailer for the new Avengers movie. You know, I got to see that, the new Avengers movie. I'm psyched about James Bond. Oh, the new James Bond movie. I don't even know when it comes out. I think it must be the end of the year. Star Wars. The new Star Wars. Star Wars is coming. Next uh, Uh, Christmas. uh, Yeah, next Christmas. Yes. Yep. So we'll have that. The end of the Hunger Games. I'm not really super geeked about that, but hey, I'll go. Well, based on your advice, we didn't go see that other one. So yeah. We'll wait on that one. To well, you're going to have to see it. I mean, well, yeah, yeah, we'll see it, but we'll see it once it comes out, like on Netflix or. Don't you hate phrases like that? You're going to have to see it. You're like, oh yeah, of course I have to see it. No, but no, you have to see it to see the next one. Like that's, you, that. Yes, <laughs> it would be. Yes. Like what? What, what happened in this yeah. time out? Yeah, yeah. They got a new movie called American Sniper that's coming out based on a true story of a Navy SEAL. So that ought to be pretty good. It's written and directed by, or not written, but directed by Clint Eastwood. I he does some pretty gosh darn good movies. I think I saw. Have I seen a trailer for that? Maybe. I think I might have. Bradley Cooper stars it. Yeah, I think so. That comes out. I don't know. Any big travel? Last you guys went to Italy. Are you doing anything fun like that this year? Or is this going to be a big fancy trip to the Walmart? <laughs> it will be. You have a lot of staycations to you have take care of your Italy bill. You have a lot of, all, you see a lot of good stuff at Walmart. It's mm-hmm. like a trip around the world. It is actually. Yeah. It's actually like a trip around the moon. <laughs> People of Walmart dot com. Yeah, a trip around. If you have never been to that website, a trip do yourself Uranus. a favor. Right. Uh, uh, no, and I'm reading these horrible jokes. Let's hear another one. You got, you right. laughed at one of them, so I'm yeah, this well one's horrible. Wrap it up. No, these are bad. Do it. The only ball will be dropping on. <laughs> nope. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Nope. The pass. Only ball to be dropping on Times Square this New Year's Eve is mine. Sincerely, Lance Armstrong. Bye, everybody. I might be back in the new year if tonight pulls it together. Tonight, the mayor's dropping the ball in New York while Congress is dropping the ball in Washington. Dumb. Isn't that great? Uh, yeah, these are not good. These are all groaners. I like, they're worse than groaners. They're just, yeah. This one's actually true. It's New Year's is just a holiday created by calendar companies who don't want you reusing last year's calendar. It is. It's like a Hallmark holiday. You know where they come at it just to sell cards? Nope. Pretty this sure. Calendar companies. Pretty sure has something to do with the sun and stars. I don't know. I think it's a racket. Okay. I think it's a racket. All right. It's like that Jim Gaffigan joke about ice cubes. Yeah, you know, they give you the water for free to freeze in it, but then you got to buy that tray. <laughs> they get you with the tray. <laughs> that's, a, that's where they're making their money. <laughs> Uh, no, tonight we are having some friends over. Uh, you're going to a party, right? Are you going to a party? No, I wasn't invited to any. You were not invited? But you could be invited to ours. Uh, it's too late. I already have plans. <laughs> to not do anything? I'm going to be on an airplane, yo. Oh, you are. Yeah. Jet setting, earning my miles, man. Got to pay them bills. You'll be getting off the plane at like 1150. Yeah. So you will be in the airport in your hometown at midnight. It's going to be fantastic. You'll be celebrating like a jet setter. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, seven-year-old and five-year-old. It's going to be wonderful. It's amazing, the miracle of technology that you can be in the basement here the day of New Year's Eve. How is it so complicated? I just get in a car and drive to the airport. Drive to the airport and then drive back to your hometown, which is... 1,700 miles away. That's right. That's why I'm, I have to fly here to record these things. It, it, it's awful. It is horrible. Two hundred dollars round trip. All right. So we end 2014 about as dumb as we began it with that silly after show. See you later, everybody. Happy New Year.